Hi, I'm CJ and this is my RC channel. In this video, I'm getting back to some building. I'm gonna finish off the uh, Chrysalis Light two meter sailplane. And uh, then I'm gonna be moving on to the, uh, the Fokker DR1 triplane. I know some people are waiting for that. So uh, uh, it is coronavirus time, uh, doing the quarantine, social distancing thing. Uh, my wife's got a compromised immune system, so we're being extra careful and staying in. And so I got a lot of time to build, and I'm going to be making good use of that, and I'm going to be doing a lot of filming and putting up some videos for you guys, okay? So where we left off with this build, uh, the plane is almost done. Uh, tail feathers are on. Uh, wing is finished and sheeted. Servos, servo in the wing is mounted servos. For the tail feathers are here, they are not yet mounted. Um, I'm going to start this process of doing the uh, doing the push rods, which are uh, 0.8 millimeter uh, carbon fiber rods inside of plastic housings that run the length of the uh, tail boom. There are these L-shaped brass fittings and uh, these need to be attached to the ends and then these little uh, rubber o-rings um, uh, go over the end uh, keeping them from coming out of the control horns the control horns are uh, fiberglass everything is designed as light as possible and as simplistic as possible um, so uh, these just are gonna glue on i'll uh, I'll show that process. Uh, once I have these in place, I will um, rubber band and uh, uh, basically use a couple of um, little sticks of wood, like uh, popsicle sticks, uh, to keep the tail feathers uh, aligned in their neutral position. And that way I can uh, size up the control rods here, and I'll be probably be using these little brass uh, fittings here. Um, the, uh, the kit came with basically a standard nylon clevis. Like so. Um, but this, uh, the pins on these are never completely round and they're big for these, uh, servo arms. These servo arms have very small holes. So as you can see, it's, it's not even close. I would need to drill these holes out to get a good fit. And uh, this is not an area that I'm going to want any play at all. Any play at all is going to manifest itself in sloppy uh, tail section movement and tail feathers that don't neutral out. And that's the most important thing. Um, let me just try to demonstrate what I'm talking about with some pieces of wood here. If this is your tail surface, okay, and here's your hinge point, okay, um, you always want the tail surface to return to the same position. So if you go up and it returns to this position, you go down and it returns to this position, you've got a problem. You always want it to, regardless of the direction of motion, to come back to the same uh, neutral point. If there's any variance, if you, you know, move it up and down a few times and it comes to one position, you go up and down a few times and it comes back to a different position, you've got a problem with your push rod somewhere and that's something you need to square away because you'll never really be able to, to properly tune the plane. Uh, you'll never uh, get your trim set right. And when you're working with V-tails, uh, it's basically a combination of rudder elevator for each of the two tail surfaces. So you're, you're going to get slop in a variance of directions. And that would be really bad. So uh, something I'm going to avoid at all costs. And if I run into that during the setup, I'll demonstrate how to get rid of it. The main things to do are to... Uh, make sure that your push rods are as straight as possible. Um, the way I've got this set up, I, I ran the uh, the hoses as far as I could. I've got one longer than the other because one 
uh, servo horn is slightly further forward of another uh, so I may trim this one down a teeny bit because I want enough room for the um, for the clevis and for the uh, the brass rod I may have to trim these rods down a teeny bit these connectors or adapters or whatever you want to call them um, to uh, because they don't necessarily need to be this big and um, being brass they're a little heavy uh, surprisingly for how small they are uh, so you know eliminating weight at this point is uh, always a good thing all through this process because of the type of airplane um, I've opted to go with this uh, little receiver here this is a um, four channel it's part of the the lemon series it will um, it'll pair up with my uh, DX8 this is just a three channel radio and uh, other than the VTL mixing, there's nothing complicated going on in the programming. So there's no need uh, for a uh, more complicated receiver. This plane is not going to be flying at great distances uh, or at super high altitudes, most likely. So again, um, I'm not worried about uh, communication. I'm just going to go ahead and uh, use this to start with if it turns out. Um, I have any kind of reception issues. I'll just go to a, a spectrum receiver. I've got uh, actually I've got some lemons that are six channels that have uh, considerably, considerably longer antenna leads. Uh, this is my ESC. It's just a basic little uh, five volt three amp. Um, it'll take the 7.2 volts from this uh, 2S LiPo and take it down to something that the receiver can use without uh, burning it out or burning out servos this is the battery that i'm going to be using these uh, turned out to be an excellent size for this and for small gliders in general i have another two meter glider uh, on deck to build for this spring uh, that's the mad res it's another two meter uh, res glider rudder elevator spoiler and so i just a few minutes ago ordered a couple more of these uh, so i'll have a few extras i want at least two per plane uh, so that I can, you know, go to the field with a couple of them charged and, and fly for hours on end. Other than that, uh, that's basically where we're at, caught up uh, on this build process. Um, I haven't decided whether I'm going to use this sticker or not on the airplane. I would just put it on the central on the wing if I do use it. We'll see about that later. Um, other than that... Uh, everything as going to plan I've been uh, very pleased with this kit it has gone together very well um, good build techniques great design it's very light and uh, looking forward to seeing how it stacks up against the mad res uh, there's another two meter uh, that I may pick up as well that is the um, the slight v2 exact same class uh, slightly different building styles and techniques these are all uh, competition level um, high-end uh, for the class um, res is a very nice class I know I've talked about this before uh, but if you're uh, just getting into these videos uh, and you haven't gone back and watched from the beginning res is a class that was designed uh, to be very simple and easy for entry-level uh, builders and flyers to get into uh, minimum of controls uh, you know up down left right um, and uh, a spoiler to uh, aid in landing um, mostly wood construction uh, generally you don't see any carbon fiber other than a usually a carbon fiber tail boom and sometimes a carbon fiber uh, tube in the wings uh, to serve as a main strut if I get that other glider that'll be three of uh, the same class of gliders I'll get to compare them all for flight characteristics and weight and um, I'm not sure if there's going to be any uh, uh, rest, two meter rest competitions um, within driving distance of me. But if there are, I'll try to get out for some of that this season. I'm going to try to fly some uh, F5J competitions, as some of you may be aware. I've got a couple of F5Js. Um, I have a uh, 2.5 meter uh, fiberglass fuse bo um, balsa uh, carbon fiber uh, wing um, that is a uh, entry-level F5J and I have a Shadow 2 
which is a full-on all carbon uh, mostly you know pre-assembled uh, competition glider at 3.7 meter wingspan plus or minus uh, that's looking to be a beautiful plane and uh, I did an unboxing video on that I haven't started the build that'll probably be another month or so down the road uh, I've still got to collect some items for that anyway that'll all get covered down the road I don't want to ramble on um, I'm just gonna get going on these push rods and uh, you're gonna see a lot of videos this spring so I hope you guys are looking forward to that and enjoy them these are the clevises that I've decided to use um, I got these from Esprit Tech uh, it's uh, they're very small as clevises go. Uh, let me grab one of those. They look like Dubro clevises as a comparison. Um, they're not much uh, different in overall length. Um, I would assume the thread size is, uh, or the inner diameter here is fairly similar, uh, but they are definitely thinner and lighter and it's not the weight so much as uh, the precision of a uh, of these pins um, they look like they're going to be just the right size for these servo arms I can always widen those out a little bit if I need to for these pins and that should give me a um, a much better uh, connection than uh, just these standard off-the-shelf nylon clevises well, these are off the shelf too it's um, and uh, I did decide to go with this uh, little servo mounting system. Uh, I built this a while back. If you watch the videos uh, from start to finish, you'll see where I uh, decided to go in this direction. Um, this will allow me to remove the servos if there's a problem. Uh, let, let's me get them, get everything ready. And uh, when I'm have sized everything up I can basically get everything neutral and then just glue this down to the deck and uh, be done okay so here is one of the L-shaped pieces and this is a piece of the uh, same size push rod I had some of this extra um, so basically it just slides in like so um, you will need to take uh, an X-Acto knife, uh, they mentioned this in the instructions, just stick the tip into the hole here and uh, twist it around a few times to widen it out. They come a little closed up, uh, it's not a problem, uh, it probably sacrifices the blade, but eh, you know, that's why I buy those in bulk. So definitely need to uh, prep the rod a little bit, I'm probably going to I just use a little bit of masking tape to wrap once around and have a little tab to hold and then uh, rough this up with some uh, fine grit sandpaper. Uh, it doesn't have to be a lot, you just want to kind of scuff things up a little bit and prep it so it will uh, absorb some CA. Uh, they recommend medium. Um, I basically have gap fill and thin and I know I'm not going to get gap filled down into there so I'm probably going to use uh, thin CA and just use it liberally and then uh, be a little patient about waiting on the drawings and uh, just let it do its thing so um, uh, nice simple you know elegant solution for uh, for a clevis that's one of the nice things about this kit. Everything is very well thought out, very well designed. They obviously went through numerous iterations. Uh, the gentlemen that built this are um, here in the United States. They produced the plane, the kit, here in the United States. Uh, and they've um, spent a lot of time uh, designing their uh, engineers by trade. Uh, I believe retired at this point. And uh, this is a... Uh, you know, labor of love for them. It's something that they enjoy, that they, you know, do for personal enjoyment as much as a business. In fact, I, I can't imagine they're certainly not getting rich, um, you know, with the few planes they release, um, but they are very nice. Uh, I highly recommend it, and I'm really looking forward to it. I expect it's going to fly very well. I don't know if this is going to be very obvious, but um, 
I just uh, wanted to try to show you the difference between scuffed and unscuffed. Um, I didn't uh, press this uh, masking tape down hard, just uh, wrapped it lightly around it and um, just to give me something to hold it with. Uh, want to make it easy to come off. You definitely want to be careful with these control rods. They can be cracked. You don't want to uh, bend them too much and uh, break one of them. Um, you can get um, replacements. The only place I know offhand uh, that sells uh, this size of carbon is Hyperflight. Uh, they're in uh, the UK. The address is hyperflight.co.uk. Um, if you uh, Google search Hyperflight space RC, uh, you'll probably find them. They are glider focused uh, as far as their product lines. They have a lot of um, carbon stock and other um, miscellaneous building materials. I shop at a lot of different vendors. Um, I just mentioned uh, Esprit Tech uh, for little items like this. Esprit Tech definitely has a lot of high-end connectors, uh, physical connectors, electrical connectors. Um, they have some very nice airplanes as well. Uh, they definitely um, are in a uh, higher-end realm for uh, a lot of their hardware because um, they uh, do a lot of the Eastern European radios, which are a lot more expensive, and um, some of the uh, airplanes that they uh, are involved with, or at least have parts for, are very large, high-performance 3D aircraft, uh, where you're doing things like pull-pull uh, setups on the rudders, and the uh, the servo arms are literally a, a couple of inches in width. Uh, you know, with very large, complex uh, connections on them so that you are, uh, you get a high level of precision uh, with very large control surfaces. Anyway, um, you know, Soaring USA, Esprit Tech, both in the United States. Uh, I'll, I'll shop for stuff at Hobby King. Um, they're great for uh, inexpensive items like cheap batteries, uh, inexpensive servos. Little servos like these are under ten dollars. Um, sometimes they're under six or seven dollars. I don't think I paid more than uh, eight or eleven dollars uh, for this uh, lemon receiver. So they they definitely have a place in my uh, in my quiver of uh, places to shop for. And uh, again, Hyperflight. Um, is where I uh, find uh, you know carbon like this. Um, they have they're the only place I know of anywhere, uh, United States or globally, that has um, long length carbon fiber rods, tubes, and strips. Um, they uh, usually sell in uh, 75 centimeter, three quarter meter length and 1.5 meter length and uh, finding carbon fiber rods in a 1.5 meter length is very difficult i don't know any place that sells them um, and they carry them they're a little expensive on the shipping but that's because they got to put stuff in a tube and uh, ship it overseas you can't uh, fold stuff like this and put it in the box um, you know you've got something that's 1.5 meters long and uh, you know is you know cannot be bent there's no other way uh to get around shipping that so um you know the shipping is justified okay the servos are next uh, as you can see push rods are connected uh, this is a very nice design i'm glad i left a little bit of extra um tube coming out here instead of cutting it flush off to the tube uh, there's less uh, push rod to potentially flex um, let me just go ahead and pull one of these off so I can show you the range of motion okay um, at full up where the hinge is fully extended to where it's wood on wood there's still push rod visible so 
a little more could have even been left uh, sticking out go to full well you can't go full extent but uh, you know beyond where you would ever reasonably set this control surface to adjust to um, there's you know it's better to have less control rod there's less chance of it flexing uh, so now if you look let's just do a kind of normal let's say 15 degrees or so in either direction that's not more than oh, I would say a quarter of an inch uh, maybe three sixteenths of an inch of uh, movement uh, front to rear uh, which means that when I set up clevises on the servo I'm going to do them on the uh, the lowest hole I may even uh, add an extra hole a little bit lower um, the reason being that to uh, to have as much variance in the control surface uh, to have it, it be as fluid as possible um, you want the uh, the arm to be as short as possible and still give you enough motion to get the range of motion at the control surface. Uh, getting that balance right means that when you're setting up your stick motion, um, you've got how to say this properly. There's a higher degree of granularity, I guess you could say, in the controls. Imagine that you're just going in degrees, like click, 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 you know, because a potentiometer only gives you so much um, uh, liquidity, fluidity to it, its motion. Um, if the, the more this moves versus how much motion you get at the rear, the, um, the smoother the control is going to be, the finer um, the control is going to be as far as its reactiveness versus if you jack it all the way up and you've got the maximum amount of motion here, uh, the stick, you know, moves a quarter of an inch, you know, on the transmitter and you're going, you know, full lock and then full lock in the other direction. And that's the opposite of what you want. Uh, you want the stick to, to, you know, be able to move fully on the transmitter and uh, uh, you know to its extents and then you use as much of that or as little of that as you need but if you jack it all the way up um, you're you're stuck there you know you've got you know you can only do so much adjustment and you can always uh, if you're doing it you know down low and doing the fine tuning at the transmitter at the programmatic end of things versus doing it here so yeah i'm i'm probably almost definitely going to want to drill one more hole because the way this is set up here there's so little movement so if i were to put if i were to put the clevis at the top here with the amount of motion this has full left i mean full up full down this would only move about this far okay that uh that quarter inch space there and which means that at the stick that you know only a few degrees of stick movement you know maybe five to eight degrees in either direction and you're as far as you'd ever want to move it even beyond the mechanical limits of the control surface because uh, going up, this is going to go wood to wood and it won't go any further. You'd break it if you kept pulling at it. You'd break a control rod or break the wood or break the horn, whatever's weakest. And you definitely don't want that. So, uh, doing setting things up that way is always better. I've seen so many people who, um, you know, will put all the leverage on the horn here, you know, put the clevis all the way up and it's like, yeah, the, that gives the servo so much more power over the control surface. Not exactly true. And 
power isn't what you want, um, gradient of control is what you want. Anyway, at this point, I can put this back on the tail surface, and then I can come up here and I can start uh, trimming up, uh, rough trimming the uh, control rods. I'm probably gonna need to take a little bit of this housing off here uh, and figuring out exactly where I'm going to uh, mount my little servo tray. So once I've got the uh, clevises onto, uh, onto these little brass suckers, then I can figure out where things are actually going to go and I can cut the uh, control rod wherever I need it. Now one of the nice things about um, these, it's a Dubro item, they come with the kit. The uh, control rod can pass through this end to end. They can come in through the back and out the front. So there's a lot of uh, gluing surface available uh, to be used and I would recommend um, you know cutting the control rod longer than shorter um, more control rod in here means more of a gluing surface ideally I would want to use an epoxy on this so I'm gonna think about it as I'm measuring and uh, getting these guys out and uh, drilling my control horns so I have uh, I've gotten the two clevises set up on the servo arms and they are perfect. Um, and the, the arm moves and pivots freely uh, but there is absolutely no slack. Um, there's no play and that can be harder to do than one would think sometimes uh, especially when you're dealing with plastics um, you know you try to widen the hole a little bit and you get it too far uh, and then all you can do is start with a fresh horn one of the things that will help you is a good set of digital calipers and uh, in this case um, a set of twist drills uh, this was very inexpensive to get this set. It's a pretty broad set. It goes from almost three millimeters down to uh, I think 0.2 millimeters, the uh, the smallest bit, and uh, you just have a little chuck and a little hand drill, and uh, that can allow you to make very small, very precise holes. The holes in these arms were a little bit too small, and so. First thing you want to do is take the fitting and measure it with the calipers so you know how big the hole needs to be. Generally the best thing to do at that point is start with something a little smaller in the way of the drill bit uh, in case your measurement wasn't 100% and drill a little smaller because you can always drill uh, with a larger one afterwards and uh, expand the hole but you can't shrink it once you've you've done it you've done it so to get this right and uh, any bit of play in here is going to be dramatically uh, visualized at the tail uh, as far as a, a tail surface that doesn't center I think these drills I got them on Amazon for about 11 or 12 dollars definitely something worth picking up because trying to enlarge a hole with a number 11 blade um, can be done, but you end up, you know, you try to do it from both sides, uh, otherwise you get a funnel-shaped hole. Even then you're getting a slightly hourglass-shaped hole, it's just not precise. Having the tools to measure and uh, drill proper holes is essential to making small items function precisely. So now that I have these done, I'm going to decide if I want to trim any of this off and uh, I'll mount everything up and do a, uh, a fit test um, with uh, the rods rough cut and uh, we'll see where that goes uh, so you know 
fit, measure, fit, test, do it again, test, fit, test, fit, test, fit. I don't know if any of you guys are car guys. I, I've always been a car guy. Uh, rebuilt my first engine when I was in my early teens, barely had a driver's license. Cars, it's the same thing. If you guys, uh, or if any of you ladies in the audience, if you ever watch some of the car shows on the Motor Trend channel, the really good ones like, uh, uh, I forget his first name, uh, Fuchs, and uh, Bitchin' Rides, those guys build some beautiful cars. They are virtually works of art, show quality cars, and they are constantly disassembling, reassembling, disassembling, reassembling, fitting, tweaking, testing, putting back together, taking it back apart. That's how you get things done right. That's how you get things to be precise, perfect, and that's how you want to approach your builds. Uh, you know, the old measure twice, cut once, try measuring four times, you know, <laughs> and then cut once and leave yourself room to cut again if you need to, that kind of thing. Um, that's, that's how you get pr uh, precision and uh, that's how you get good at doing this kind of stuff is uh, practice and repetition and, and patience above all. Patience with yourself to let yourself take the time to do things the right way. If you don't have the right tool, the patience to put down the model, order the drill bits, wait for them to show up, and then finish going. Delayed gratification is one of the most important things uh, in life, in my opinion. Learning to delay gratification, learning to put something aside, do something else in the meantime, uh, so that you can pick it up later with the right tools or the right parts and, and do it correctly. Uh, sorry if I'm rambling a lot during this video, uh, but uh, just leaning toward a little bit of life lessons, that kind of thing. Um, trying to help you guys become better modelers. Okay, continuing. I have... Getting a little more light there. Okay, the servos are not mounted. I made a decision to not use the little tray that I had built. Uh, this is the way modeling goes, especially when you're doing custom stuff. Sometimes you think you're going to use something or do something a certain way, and then you, you know, see a better way or something changes. In this case, the way I had the uh, servos uh, aligned with each other, the spread on the horns was pretty wide, and I was concerned uh, that these uh the brass uh, tubes threaded tubes might touch up against the edge of the wood and create a, a unwanted artificial bump stop as it were and um so i rearranged the servos now they're not anchored yet and that was another advantage to doing it this way was that i used 30 minute epoxy on the control rods. I roughed them up and then I used a, a small piece of uh, scrap control rod uh, to get glue and uh, insert it into these brass tubes a little bit at a time, just kind of like, you know, Q-tipping it in. And, and then uh, when I was done, getting a small amount into the tube. I didn't want too much because I didn't want it to push out of the end and then glue the clevis to the uh, the brass tube and then I can't make adjustments from there. Uh, so I put uh, a light coating of epoxy on the end of the control rod that I had roughed up and then I kind of slid the servos into place. Uh, this one first followed by this one. Now what I've done here is I have raised this servo. First, I, I put down a 1 64th inch plywood doubler, just a piece of scrap that uh, reinforces the floor and provides a smoother surface for mounting uh, the servo. Uh, then I created a little lift plate and a little end plate to raise this uh, forward most servo up so 
um, if you can see there's a decent amount of space between the control rod here and the rear mounted servo so when this servo's arm uh, tracks all the way over this is still not touching the servo so there's no interference issue the advantage of that uh, and the placement of these two is that the control rods are almost perfectly straight uh, there's only a slight angling just a little bit of a spread on the two control rods they go straight down the fuselage and straight out to the tail section so these rods are as close to a straight line as you're going to get which means there's less chance of um, any issues with um, uh, binding or uh, getting a, a different result from one side to the other or ending up with that situation where you have a, uh, a you can't maintain a constant center all of those potential issues are um, alleviated or eliminated by having the rods be as straight as they are so what I'm probably gonna do I've thought about you know putting down some blocks um, and then uh, you know making a crossbar to screw these down but I think what I'm gonna do at this point is just hot glue them in place I've considered two-sided tape but two-sided tape uh, can be unreliable Sometimes when you're sticking it to wood, you don't always uh, get a, a long-term uh, result that's positive. So I think I'll, I'll just go with hot glue and, uh, you know, just take my chances that I hopefully never have to pry these little suckers out again and replace one of them. They both are in, you know, functioning mechanical order now. Uh, I've run them, you know, through the tester many times during this process and uh, there's no issues there's no grinding they are a, um, a digital servo and I believe they are metal geared as well the uh, the output shaft for the um, servo arm is metal so you know albeit a very light servo they're they're still reasonably strong so hopefully there's no problems down the road and I don't ever need to replace one at the field um, anyway, uh, I've actually never had a servo fail ever, um, in all the years. And I hope I'm not jinxing myself, you know, across the fingers and all, but, um, yeah, I've never, uh, I've never had a servo go bad on anything, cars, planes, uh, you name it. So hopefully, uh, I don't have to deal with that. Anyway, I am just about finished. Once I hot glue these down, and I'm just waiting for these to dry, you know, slide the battery in, uh, pair the receiver, plug everything in, mount the wing, balance, uh, get the CG set up, and then it's ready to, uh, to do those first couple test flights. So uh, that'll all be in the next video. I uh, hope you enjoyed this. Uh, if you're building one of these, I hope this helps you. If you're building similar plans, I hope you learned a thing or two along the way. Or if you're scratch building, uh, hopefully you've picked up some techniques while watching these videos. Thank you for watching. Please click like. Please subscribe to the channel. That really is helpful. Uh, it only takes a second for you, if you're not already logged in, to uh, create yourself a, a email account on Google or use an existing account, set up a profile. Um, you can leave it completely blank if you want and then just uh, subscribe. Um, and not just for me, but others out there, uh, there's not a lot of uh, reward for the amount of effort that the YouTuber community uh, goes through to provide you with content, especially people who are doing what I'm doing, uh, in, which is, you know, providing content for a very niche you know hobby or industry i'd very much appreciate your support and to those of you who have subscribed and comment and click like on my videos i really appreciate it that's great uh, can't thank you guys enough